Everybody see that okay? Yep. Okay, very good. I'm gonna be reading this. I hope this will, will uh, get a lot of discussion later on. Uh, so I appreciate holding your questions or just putting them in the queue until we get to the, uh, the uh, question session at the end. Uh, first of all, I do wanna thank uh, particularly Ned and T for looking over this presentation and giving all the help uh, they have. Uh, the Boston Study Group to, for having some discussions this past year about conspiracy theories and the like. And of course, to Nancy and Keats, uh, who have tolerated uh, my, my time uh, looking at many videos of uh, uh, QAnon talkers and uh, others, uh, as well as spending a lot of time working on this. So let's get started. So this is Looking for Superman in Dangerous Worlds. Today, our culture is dominated by a rationalist worldview and rejects worldviews that claim conspiracies can be resolved by super heroic persons. Conspiracy theories are viewed as merely irrational fantasies. Pundits worry that conspiratorial perspectives contribute to political polarization and urge Americans to agree on, quote, a common set of facts, unquote. We tend to dismiss many of these worldviews as misguided and ridiculous or the product of uneducated and deranged minds. But legends and myths, as well as conspiracy theories, have been generated by cultures from time immemorial. Many who have taken conspiracy theorists seriously, however, have noted that this phenomenon is not merely about a worldview, but about the, build, but about the building of and or maintenance of community, and that members of such groups are passionate, loyal members whose beliefs are dear to them. Our task today is to make sense of these portrayals of conspiracies relative to the creation, enhancement, and maintenance of person communities. Essentially, how is it that such beliefs, such perspectives make sense for people? Historically, many of these worldviews help develop communities of people who reformulate a world that has become dangerous, threatening their lives and the survival of their way of life, their culture. They are desperate to find the behavior potential, the power, to reverse their misfortunes and look for a person or persons to lead them out of this wilderness. Mindful of Peter Osorio's maxim that quote, the world makes sense and so do people, unquote. We want to understand how conspiracy theories and conspiracy communities become vehicles for change for communities as well as vehicles endangering those very communities. We will look initially at some of the scholarship about the superhero and the psychology of conspiracy thinking. Following that, we will utilize the major parameters of communities to help us describe and understand a conspiracy community. We will apply these concepts to describe a millenarian community generally, and specifically QAnon as a current example of a millenarian movement. Finally, we will use the descriptive approach to clinical case formulation and quote, drop the details, unquote, of the QAnon worldview to examine the patterns and seek an understanding of the QAnon community. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. That's of course the opening of the 1950s Superman TV series. When the comic book character created in the 1930s upon which so many of the subsequent superhero tales have been based. But is this superhero fantasy just some superficial 20th century creation? In fact, persons have been fascinated with superhuman functioning as far back as we can tell. From Moses' magical staff empowered by God and the miracles of Jesus, to the gods of Mount Olympus and the many hope for messiahs of history, the concept of the hero, superhero savior, has been part of European culture and other human cultures as well. Joseph Campbell showed the universality of the hero archetype in his classic work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And James Scott in The Art of Not Being Governed writes that such mythology and cultural statuses are plentiful in the Southeast Asian hills cultures known as Zomian. The concept of a hero figure seems to be fundamental to human cultures. Lars Schmink cite writes the following about heroes. One of the most common truths can be found in the figure of the hero through which societies keep enacting a recurrence of birth, continuously reintroducing new life into the community. 
Heroes, Campbell argues, bring with them visions, ideas, and inspirations. Heroes are the catalysts of change and transformation. They represent the utopian impulse of a society, and in, and in that they unlock a potential which is hidden within us all and which allows for human progress. A hero always embodies what we believe is best in ourselves, representing the values and morals of a society, the idealized vision we have of ourselves and our society. Indeed, sometimes the world needs saving. And this idealized vision of a superhero can help inspire a community to protect its existence, which brings us to January 6, 2021. Depending on your political and cultural worldviews, approximately 500 individuals either attacked our pillars of democracy or rebelled against the corruption of the federal government. Driven not only by politicians with a range of motivations to overturn the, overturn the 2020 election, but also by a conspiracy theory that the Democrats stole the election, a loose coalition of groups, including Donald Trump supporters, Proud Boys, Boogaloo members, Oath Keepers, Reaper Centers, ex-military and QAnon members, as well as individuals wearing t-shirts and carrying flags espousing white supremacist and neo-Nazi views, assaulted and overran Capitol Police in an apparent attempt to stop the certification of the election. But what was the purpose, the significance of their actions? For some, it was probably creating havoc, breaking the rules, defying authority. And for others, it became a day of entertaining protests and risk-taking. But many were attempting to right the wrongs they believed had been done to them. Whatever elements of veracity the conspiracy theories had that incited the mob's passions, one cannot ignore the types of worlds these folks came from and the belief by many that they were true patriots attempting to restore values lost by America. Listen to these, this audio from two QAnon supporters actually um, watching the riots on January 6th. Patriots are in the building. It's beautiful. <laughs> Many, arrest, many persons arrested for this attack claim they were invited to stop the steal by Donald Trump. The president declared there was sufficient voter fraud to throw the outcome in doubt. But such a claim could not have been had, could not have had the power it had without several major conspiracy theories that had been circulating for years. One of these theories was espoused by a mysterious person or persons named Q. The QAnon theory claimed that Democrats were controlled by a group of elitist pedophiles, including Hillary Clinton and George Soros, who were sex trafficking children and drinking their blood to extend their own lives. Trump was chosen by God, a true savior, a superhero to save America and the world from these evil individuals. According to QAnon members, Trump would lead the storm, the day of reckoning, a judgment day in which the true American patriots would save their country. For many, January 6th was the beginning of this storm. What had been an easily dismissible bizarre worldview of QAnon followers had turned into real world violence. Charismatic leaders, Saviors, heroes, and superheroes have emerged throughout history and in many different cultures. Marginalized, oppressed, threatened groups will characteristically develop myths about a new world to come, about an outsider, a renegade who is powerful enough to save the community from the dominance of another political community. And these myths tend to lead to prophecies and persons casting others as the rebellious saviors and not infrequently lead to actual rebellion and even change. In his classic work, In Pursuit of the Millennium, Norman Cohn summarizes the multiple millenarian movements arising in Europe between 1100 and 1500 AD. By the way, the term millenarian is derived from the belief that there would be a second coming of Christ, 
who would reign for a millenary or millennium, that is a thousand years, of peace and blessedness. Kong goes on to write, quote, revolutionary millenarianism drew its strength from a population living <clears throat> on the margin of society, peasants without land or with too little land even for subsistence, journeymen and unskilled workers living under the continuous threat of unemployment, beggars and vagabonds. In fact, from the amorphous mass of people who were not simply poor, but who could find no assured and recognized place in society at all. These people lacked the material and emotional support afforded by traditional social groups. Their kinship groups had disintegrated and they were not effectively organized in village communities or in guilds. For them, there existed no regular institutionalized methods of voicing their grievances or pressing their claims. Instead, they waited for a prophet to bind them together in a group of their own. Cohn points out that major community disasters, such as war, environmental disasters, famine, economic upheaval, and disease, including the Black Death, accompanied millenarianism during this period. A prophet or savior would arise in these populations and recast the world as one that can change, and that the mission of these disenfranchised individuals was to follow the prophet and transform the world into one without sin, a world of love, prosperity, and peace. These prophets recast the people as having a powerful place in the world, and the mission coalesced the group and focused them on solving these apparently unsolvable problems. Cohen goes on to write, quote, those who attach themselves to such a savior saw themselves as a holy people, and holy just because of their unqualified submission to the savior and their unqualified devotion to the eschatological mission as defined by him. They were his good children, and shared in a supernatural power. It was not only that the leader deployed his power for their benefit, they themselves, so long as they clung to him, partook in that power and thereby became more than human, saints who could neither fail or fall. In 1949, Karl Popper coined the term conspiracy theory and noted that these, I, these ideas typically postulated some invisible or hidden force behind wars, famines, disease, economic downturns, and the like. He noted that what was, what was thought of as the result of the powerful gods of Mount Olympus had been altered to be the result of perhaps the protocols of the elders of Zion, or a secret intellectual society like the Illuminati, or more recently, the deep state. Conspiracy theory scholars Karen Douglas, Robbie Sutton, and Alexandra Chachaka describe conspiracy theories as having three basic functions. One, epistemic. The theory satisfies a need to explain the world. Two, existential. Participating as a member of the group gives the person a place of value, someone who is knowledgeable and therefore important. And three, social. The members find a social motive to continue their connections to others who share their beliefs. Cohn notes that there are several characteristic patterns to the conspiracy thinking that drove these movements. These include a Manichean or dualistic view of good and evil forces, a strong correlation between catastrophic social hardship and the rise of such movements, and the search for and choosing of a savior or charismatic leader. Elitist community members seen as having betrayed the community, whether they were the clergy, the nobility, or royalty, <clears throat> were cast as the evil forces destroying the community. Frequently, Jewish community members were accused of various renditions of the blood libel, the kidnapping of Christian children to use their blood in the making of Passover matzah. Messiah prophesied the coming of a righteous world and the vanquishing of the evil forces. Such prophecies could lead to attacks, frequently deadly ones, on the community members cast as the evil ones. What becomes clear is that the term theory only describes a portion of what persons are doing by believing <clears throat> in such a perspective. The phenomenon is rarely merely a belief, but a set of behavioral practices, new ways to deal with highly problematic situations. Indeed, conspiracy theorists tend to be critics of the dominant culture. Prominent community members are devalued as deficient, as failing the community. Some members claim places of prominence they never had but thought they were promised, and the whole community can be upended and then reconstituted. 
Revolts occur and the viability of the culture is challenged. Popper, Douglas et al. and Cohn are describing conspiracy communities attempting to reconstitute the culture. It's difficult enough to change another person's mind about merely what is the case if what is at stake is the truth value of a statement. But if what is at stake is one's sense of self-esteem, one's place in the world, one's connections and the practices a person engages in, perhaps her way of life, then this person holds on to this wor world for dear life. Excuse me. Crypto psychology utilizes parametric analysis to describe and understand communities and cultures. Developed originally by Peter Osorio <clears throat> and expanded by descriptive psychologists <clears throat> Anthony Putman, Joe Jeffrey, Mary Roberts, Ray Bergner, CJ Peake, Wynn Schwartz, and others. The parameters of community and culture will be described in the relation to a particular paradigm case. A paradigm case, as Lori mentioned last night, is one in which persons familiar with a particular entity, an X, would state, quote, if there ever was a case of X, by God, this is one, unquote. We will let QAnon stand for a paradigm case of a millenarian conspiracy community. Osorio's description of cultures will be our approach to describe and understand conspiracy communities. The parameters of a culture are the following where CU stands for culture, W-O-L, way of life, equivalent to culture, M, members, S, status, SP, social practices, W, world, L, locution or language, CP, choice principles, and MI, Michigan, mission, which is not usually uh, in this set of parameters, but there'll be an explanation when we discuss mission as a parameter here, why it is included. I will utilize each of these parameters by noting what characterizes what characteristics of QAnon will become the parametric value under each particular parameter. Be aware, aware that one community, QAnon, is proposing and acting as an improved community relative to the dominant community. The dominant political community, as Q members see it, is corrupt, and QAnon proposes to follow their savior and alter the makeup of the dominant community by cleansing the old community of these corrupting forces. QAnon makes the claim that it is they who espouse and act on the real American values and have the standing to degrade the folks who have been the evil forces and ostracized them from the community, thus returning the community to its once righteous position. Members. Members of a conspiracy community identify themselves as such and are recognized and accredited as members by other community members. Not infrequently, a pattern emerges that these members are also members of certain other more established communities. In QAnon, many members tend to espouse a judgment day, a day of reckoning. Many religious folks would find such ideas to be familiar and comforting. Statistics show that 55% of Q members make under $75,000 a year, and only 30% have bachelor degrees or better. Both level of income and education are major measures of worth in American society. Consequently, many members may tend to feel marginalized or devalued by the more dominant communities. Although the overlap between militia groups and QAnon is not established, a research question is whether there is a disproportional overlap between the two groups. In addition, there is some data suggestion, suggesting that 44%, 44% of violent actors in the January 6th attack had experienced significant trauma in their lives. Note the increase in QAnon membership in March 2020, when the COVID pandemic became a reality in the United States. Persons living in dangerous worlds may have a strong tendency to join conspiracy groups. Statuses. A status in a community designates a place or a position a person has in relation to others in the community and designates the behaviors or practices in which, he, in which he is eligible to participate. In a baseball game, the batter, the shortstop, the umpire, the manager, and the center fielder are different statuses. In a conspiracy community, the following are some of the major statuses that characterize the community. The nefarious force. QAnon designates certain members of the dominant community as eligible for this status. 
Particular politicians like Hillary Clinton or perhaps members of the deep state are assigned to represent these nefarious forces. These members have created the evil circumstances endured by the common members and are the individuals to blame for the catastrophic circumstances in the community. QAnon members assert that the evil members not only sex traffic children, but drain and drink children's blood for the health benefits of adrenochrome. Traitors. By violating their trusted positions in the dominant community, nefarious forces are also traitors, not merely enemies of the people. Traitors steal behavior potential twice, harm the community twice. They do it once by failing to act as members in good standing, and they do it again by secretly undermining the core values and practices of the community. Betrayed members. QAnon claims that as American citizens, they have been betrayed as well by the nefarious force. The elitist political actor is generally an insider who has been entrusted with power to serve the interests of the dominant community, but has undermined the choice principles of the culture in the community, and instead has exploited the community for her own evil self-interest. Savior hero. The superhero Superman is foretold to save the community and return it to the utopia utopia that the nefarious force has taken from the people. For QAnon, Donald Trump is cast as the savior. He is described as planning and plotting to save America from the swampy, pedophilic deep state with the help of the military, QAnon members, and other patriots. As noted by Cohen above, Trump as president affirms a kind of holiness, elevating the worth of his followers. Victimized members. Community members are victims of the nefarious force. For QAnon, the members, the, the members are the children who are abducted, trafficked, and their blood drained by the nefarious force. Adult members also regard themselves as victims of the conspiracy woven by the evil members. They see themselves as having had their freedoms constrained by the nefarious forces. True believers. These tend to be the core members who eat, drink, and sleep QAnon. They see themselves anointed by Donald Trump and gain enhanced standing or status by virtue of being in such a position. Others may also be members who believe some of the values of the community, but not others. Members in the know, the true insiders. One of the unique qualities of conspiracy communities is the notion of secrecy. Members claim to be, quote, in the know, unquote, and claim the special status that the rest of you have missed. We really know what is going on and don't be fooled by what you see before your eyes. The world is not as it seems. You, whether a person or persons is cast as a government insider with the highest security clearance. Note the status enhancement this is for many members of Q who are encouraged to quote, do the research, unquote, and take pride in uncovering levels of the conspiracy against the good guys. Grifters, false prophets. Conspiracy communities are vulnerable to persons wanting to exploit the members' needs for meaning, safety, and increased behavior potential, generally by posing as the savior and exploiting the relationship for personal gain. QAnon gear has been monetized, and no doubt the income from these sales does not necessarily support the community. True believers can be fooled and will re redescribe apparent traitorous behavior by the savior to preserve the savior's status. Note the example of Donald Trump. Stop the steal and the money, money donated to Trump as a result. Some grifters will be identified and such a position is a violation of community standards of QAnon and will be grounds for elimination from the QAnon community. Others may not be, be identified by an inside QAnon member, but more likely by a critic outside QAnon. Other possible statuses. Data from Pew Research suggests that about 15% of Americans give some credence to QAnon worldviews, but we would not expect the number of true believers to be that high. Instead, Kathleen Ballou, describing the community of white power Americans, distinguishes different levels of statuses, and as a, as a, as a comparison, describes a range of levels of involvement that various members might have in the Q movement. This is Baloo's circle to membership. One, the white power true believers, quote, who go to white power churches, they marry other people in the movement. They've extended family and marital relationships within the movement and so forth, unquote. Level two, 
people who might go to a Klan rally or regularly read Klan newspapers and who make financial contributions. Level three, a more diffuse circle of people who don't themselves give money and might not go to a rally, but who regularly consume ideas and materials. And number four, and this is the one Ballou is much most, most worried about in the white supremacist movement because of the size of this group. The circle of folks where, quote, somebody might not read something that's marked as a conspiracy theory or content from a Ku Klux Klan chapter, but they might agree with some of the ideas, especially if the sources are family relationships or social relationships, unquote. Social practices. Social practices are what there is to do for members of a community. Driving to the store, getting an education, making dinner, playing basketball and so forth are social practices. Social practices call for members to behave relative to one another. And the significance of what a person is doing by doing that is related to the practices he is engaging in and the community within which the practice takes place. Basic needs disruption. Recall above that characteristic of millenarian conspiracy communities is the circumstances in which the basic needs of the community are under threat. Osorio describes a basic need in the following way. A basic need is a condition or requirement such that if not satisfied at all, deliberate action and the participation in social practices is impossible. He goes on to summarize some of the literature on this and describes some of these basic needs as the following. Order and meaning, adequacy, autonomy, competence, self-esteem, safety and security, physical health, love and affection. As noted above, conspiracy communities and particularly activist ones such as millenarian types tend to arise under conditions of basic needs disruption. The old social practices have failed to satisfy basic needs and community members come face to face with disaster. In addition to COVID, the US has not been an economic giant if you're in the bottom 75% of the population and in income. While the wealthy have accumulated much more wealth, the middle class and lower have lost buying power. We just ended a 20 year war. When viewed through these lenses, one is not surprised at the plethora of conspiracies from the 9-11 truthers to anti-vaxxers to QAnon that have arisen. Exposing child sex trafficking. One of the core practices is exposing child sex trafficking. If one is against child sex trafficking and publicly who could not be, then you are one of us. QAnon sites will not infrequently list reports of arrests of child sex abusers. This is one of the reasons QAnon has grown as large as it has. The interest fee, the entrance fee is cheap. Gathering the evidence, doing the research. Q members will proudly say that they follow the evidence. Besides the quote drops unquote that Q provides for the members, QAnon members peruse the news and anything else for evidence for what the sex trafficking socialist Democrats and or the deep state is up to. Q makes the drops of the crumbs and the bakers describe the patterns that such pieces of evidence indicate. Q members, of course, do not trust fake news. Critiquing the culture. QAnon followers frequently act as cultural and political critics by relentlessly finding fault with actions of many politicians and other public figures. These critics generally advocate, eliminate, advocate elimination from the dominant community as a solution to these corrupt nefarious forces. Sounding the alarm. QAnon members are often predicting the coming of the storm. This is to precede the great awakening when Trump will, mat, will march in to clean out the swamp and restore America to its previous greatness. Taking part in the practice of warning the community of danger is a fundamental practice of communities. Cheering on Superman. Q members, whether at political rallies or in online chat rooms, praise Trump as doing no wrong and affirm him as their savior. There is a kind of collective behavior potential that acting as part of a cheering fan base grants to each member. Such practices tend to be preserved, even in the face of evidence to the contrary, because of this wholesale acquisition of behavior potential. Using violence to bring about change. Given the worldview of good versus evil, one is not surprised that violence has tended to arise from within these communities. Evil cannot be negotiated with, only eliminated. The FBI notes that, quote, researchers, unquote, 
who decide an individual or a group is involved with, for instance, sex trafficking, may very well begin to, har to harass these targets and even threaten violence. Pizzagate was carried out by Edgar Welch, secretly wanting to save the children, impris imprisoned at DC Comet's ping pong pizza parlor. Listen to this following the video. By the way, if you haven't seen this video before, he made this on his way from Wisconsin to DC before he shot up the pizza parlor and fortunately did not hurt anyone. In addition, what cannot be dismissed here are several other factors, such as the number of ex-military and law enforcement personnel who took part in the January 6th uh, insurrection. World. The world of the community is the totality of what the members take to be the case, the totality of what is real for the members. Conspiracy communities are distinctive in that they see the world in a particular way a way that conventional communities regard as peculiar. Note the following. Q drops in world reformulation. Q's message in whatever form helped develop the nature of the world for Q members. Here is the initial Q drop from fall of 2017. Quote, HRC extradition, HRC Hillary Rodham Clinton. HRC extradition already in motion, effective yesterday with several countries in case of cross-border run. Passport approved to be flagged effective 10.30 at 12.01 a.m. Expect massive riots organized in defiance and others fleeing the U.S. to occur. USM's, U.S. Marines, will be flagged, will, will conduct the operation while activated. Proof check, Just locate a member and ask if activated for duty 10.30 across most major cities, unquote. The grand design. In contrast to the threat to basic needs, the world of the conspiracy community is a place in which there is no chaos or randomness, in which everything is connected to everything else. With this as a given, the ordinary member will be able to see the patterns and understand and deal with what is actually happen happening. The worldview is a claim about behavior potential. The world is not inscrutable. Eventually, we can manage things. A dangerous world. A world in which basic needs are threatened in which nefarious forces are present, and in which all members are victims and threatened by traitorous others is a dangerous one. A dangerous world is provocative and intrinsically elicits a hostile response. Listen to this audio from a former QAnon member. You, you have just this huge group of people that, that feel that their country is in danger, their children are in danger, um, their freedom is in danger, and so they feel like they have to go to war and they have to fight to get things back right. A dualistic world. Good does exist, but exists because of a powerful savior who will arrive to restore the rightful order and save the people. It's good versus evil. There is no in between. You're either with us or against us. Disguise, secrecy, and deception. It's a world in which nefarious forces deceive you that the news is fake, that the only truly trusted source is the savior hero. This view, of course, encourages members to turn away from the dominant community members towards members of the conspiracy community. This view also tends to preserve the community when predictions and prophecies fail. The general description is that Superman has a plan and is working, quote, behind the scenes to save the community. A dramatic world. 
It may be dangerous and secret, but if it is anything, the world of the conspiracy community is dramatic and seductive. Several articles have compared the Q community to a multiplayer online role-playing community and that, that, and that the quest never ends, there are always new clues to come, and with the new quote quests comes new behavior potential. I want to thank Ralph Wexler for alerting me to that article several months ago. A utopian world to come. A true millenarian savior must promise peace, prosperity, justice, and the like. Quote, the Great Awakening, unquote, mimicking the 19th century American evangelical movement is frequently cited by QAnon. Supporting communities. Other larger, more established communities tend to supply the conspiracy community members with particular worldviews and also underpin the legitimacy of the community. For QAnon, both some Christian evangelicals, ex-military personnel, and members of private militia groups may all serve the supportive function. Roberts notes how new practices, new worlds, new communities to survive must be affirmed by others, by the existing community members of already established communities. Language. He was distinguished by a variety of inside concepts and ways of describing them. As mentioned above, such language as drops, crumbs, bakers, the storm, the great awakening, also red pill normies and many other Locutions characterize QAnon. Red pill comes from the Matrix movie and indicates willingness to learn the hidden truths of the world. And normies are anyone who does not belong to Q. And a side note here, here a supportive online community movement that developed to support misogynistic young men in the early 2000s was using terms like red pill and normies long before QAnon. Choice principles. We have already mentioned some of the choice principles of QAnon, including, quote, the children need saving, unquote, the deep state is hiding its plans for us, and the mainstream press is not to be trusted, a grand design of secrecy. WWG1, WGA, this is the motto of QAnon and stands for where we go one, we go all. Finally, satisfaction accompanies participation. QAnon gives every member the opportunity to seek the truth, they say to do your own research, to discover what is hidden, and then as noted above, allows members even to harass others suspected of being part of the nefarious forces. Mission. Tony Putman distinguished communities per se from a more specialized community, the organization. The main distinction is a mission parameter that serves to prioritize the practices of the members of an organization toward a common goal. To describe a conspiracy community as an organization, however, would be misleading with regard to the level of overt structure and consistency of its practices. But what is clear about conspiracy communities is that each tends to work toward a common singular goal, a mission. QAnon's mission is to save the children and restore the United States to its previous state. The common person will again occupy a place of value, the people will again rule, and the culture will again favor the common citizen as opposed to the elite. QAnon treats its members as patriots, whose mission is to join with Savior Trump to bring about a utopian community. Dropping the details. How can we come to make sense of QAnon, a community of rather bizarre beliefs? Osorio has described an effective approach to clinical case formulation. Essentially, the task is to look beyond the particulars and look for the significance of what is betrayed by the client. In this case, we want to look beyond the details of the worldview of QAnon and establish the significance of this world for its members. In the language of QAnon, we want to quote, bake, unquote, the community itself. The following statements begin to make sense then of what this community is doing. One, we are living in a dangerous world affected by forces that are both secret and unknown as well as out of our control and no longer can we count on the cultural elite for help and support. Two. We have hope because we support and value each other and are united by our care by our care for one another. Three, together with our holy leader, we are powerful and righteous people and deserve to solve the problems of this world by bringing evil to justice. Four, by following the evidence, we remain focused on making a better world for ourselves and especially for our children. Five, justice shall prevail and those who are loyal will be rewarded 
and those who have betrayed us will be banished from the community. And six, we must resort to degradation and at times violence to reconstitute the community because the usual means of truth finding and conflict resolution have been corrupted by the controlling elite and because this controlling elite is evil and dangerous. And in our discussion, I'll invite other folks to uh, come up with other um, uh, statements of significance of other uh, dropping the detail statements. So what has happened to QAnon? Little has come to pass as Q or the community predicted, but elected representative, representatives like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, along with many of their colleagues, promote the worldview that the, that the election was stolen. Cyber Ninjas, a website run by Q supporters, just concluded a recount of the 2020 Arizona presidential ballots. Note, however, the New York Times' Stuart Thompson's essay on QAnon members from January. Quote, as Thompson says, Many members were struggling in some ways, financially or emotionally with legal troubles or addiction. As COVID-19 swept their states, many got sick and some family, some family members died. A few members were recently out of prison. Another was li living in a sober house. Thompson's article shows that several Q supporters began to seriously question whether Trump was the superhero they all believed he had been and wondered aloud if they had been the butt of the not so funny joke. Note the following. Comes to find out that, and this is going to sound bad, but if it comes to find out that she was just some kind of CIA psyop, I hate to say this, but I wouldn't even trust Trump because she was all pro Trump. That's pretty sober. Think of all the people that we follow and trust that you know, have told us about Q and explained the drops. That's really the heartbreaking part. By us believing that, you know, there's all these things going on behind the scenes, it's preventing us from doing anything because we're just sitting down waiting and watching, you know, for all this to secretly happen. And I don't think it's happening. We can't be digital warriors our whole life. We can't be keyboard warriors our whole life. We can't put all our eggs in one basket like we're doing and waiting on Trump. Our forefathers never relied on one man. We relied on each other going forward. Thompson concludes that the strength of the QAnon community would tend to preserve it. Listen to how some members describe this. One thing Q did, the, did do was get us organized to come together, to open our eyes, to listen to and track what is going wrong with our government. Just being able to kind of shoot ideas past each other and have each other kind of there to hear it, you know, us out and set us straight or help us to keep the faith and things like that. That has been a really big deal for me because I've been really going back and forth on stuff. So I want to just, just thank you because this has actually made quite a difference for me. And then play off the living on it, but it showed that we can use, we are we're powerful when we're together. I mean, it's, it's created a whole new era. It's, it's not done. It's far from over. It's not done. It's far from over. For many of us, those words are frightening and must be taken seriously. Timothy Snyder concludes that the insurrection of January 6th would be just the beginning as well. Quote, for a coup to work in 2024, the breakers will require something that Trump never quite had, an angry minority organized for nationwide violence, ready to add intimidation to an election. Four years of amplifying a big lie just might get them this. The claim that the other side stole an election is to promise to steal one yourself. It's also to claim that the other side deserves to be punished. History shows that political violence follows when prominent leaders of major political parties openly embrace paranoia, unquote. Charlie, I just wanna mention we have just a little less than 15 minutes left. Oh, we're fine. I've got uh, one minute left and we can talk. Okay. Thanks, Lori. 
QAnon supporters, as well as a great deal of American citizens, continue to see government as a problem, as corrupt, even evil. The challenges of our era, era global warming, pandemics, very large wealth gaps, war, and, and the like, continue to foretell that folks may abandon a democratic republic and instead seek powerful autocrats to solve these major existential problems. Will the next person cast as Superman or Super One be far more organized than Donald Trump? Will this superhero be able to direct follow followers to destroy the next embodiment of evil? Snyder notes how totalitarian political communities characteristically develop violent practices over a period of time. But we do have choices. One choice is to seek out and silence the voices of bizarre conspiracy theories. The caveat though, is that conspiracies do happen, politicians can be corrupt, and some governments should be changed. Moreover, a wholesale suppression of conspiracy thinking easily becomes a quashing of dissent. By taking the persons who espouse these worldviews seriously, treating them as making sense within their own worldviews, we give ourselves the opportunity to engage with our fellow citizens to solve these great challenges to our way of life. Recall Joe Jeffrey's talk from last year on Black-White Conversations as a contribution to this. But the mainstream media has, focused, has rarely focused on what has driven American citizens to communities like QAnon. I hope this essay has helped give us insight, however, into the worlds of millinery and movements and QAnon politics and will lead us closer to a future of partnering with our political adversaries to solve the great challenges of our era. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Uh, we are open now for Q&A and I see one question in the chat from Cliff Johnson. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question. Oh, thanks, Laurie. I was just kind of commenting. Um, thanks so much, Charlie. That was awesome. I feel much better about watching television now. <laughs> thanks, um, Cliff. Um, just to, I think I can do it very quick. <laughs> yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, would we call embracing conspiracy theories the same as becoming radicalized? Just a thought. And is there a useful distinction that you might make from your past work uh, on being a conspiracist versus a whistleblower? That conspirists don't see themselves as conspirists, but rather the status of whistleblower, possibly. Right. Um, and then, hey, when, remember both sides. Let me see. Yeah, the first one. <clears throat> I think when you you're talking about it depends, you know, which perspective you're taking in terms of a conspiracy theory and radicalized. Um, if um, you know. And you have to be careful with that and in, uh, in what position you're talking from, because conspiracies do happen, right? We've had the real ones. Yeah. Well, just, uh, you know, Jim Holmes taught me, I have to mention his name at least once a conference, that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not really following you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, um, and so, and also, you know, a radical, to say it's radicalized would be, a, you know, that would be a statement from more of the uh, dominant outside community. Um, say you're on the fringe and so on. It's, it, that becomes a, de a degradation of the community itself. Now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating for, you know, that, that it's great for Q to go and in, incite violent, violence and participate, not at all. What I'm advocating for is that, in that, in that, you know, you might find a few true paranoid individuals in the Q movement. In fact, there was a horrible situation a couple of months ago, I think, where a dad had decided that his children had been infected with evil. Um, he was a Q follower and that he killed them both as well as himself as a result. Uh, I think that's the, by far the exception. I think you've got real people looking for, you know, uh, places of value and, and so forth, much like millenary movements. And we need to pay attention to that. And there are a lot of people out there like that. Uh, the second part is that one of the inspirations, uh, Jane had asked me, uh, tell me why you got interested in this. I said, well, I can't, there's several things. Maybe in the discussion, I can talk about it. It'll allow me to do that. When I was uh, working on the whistleblowers last year, I ran across a video, several videos. Uh, and I also, also uh, I guess, a feature link length documentary uh, featuring a person by the name of Judy Mikovits. Anybody ever heard of Judy Mikovits? Um, She's a, she was a researcher, um, microbiologist, 
uh, who uh, was part of the ant became part of the anti-vaxxer movement very strongly and in, in the anti-masking movement. Um, uh, and when I saw this at first, she was acting as a whistleblower, and I thought, "Wait a minute, you know, this is for our stuff. This is a, doesn't fit my worldview. You know, this is out there. This is a problem." So it is clear that 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 QAnon sees themselves as whistleblowers, as community whistleblowers, um, uh, but they're not going. You remember one of the the first thing the the real whistleblower does is go, you know, to the established institution that's there to try to correct these sorts of things. Q has already dismissed the established uh, institutions. They're no longer viable. They're all corrupt. Uh, so yeah, they're a kind of whistleblower, but there's a distinction to be made, I think. Well, thank you. Um, and one last point, if I could, I think the most important thing is, you know, we all think, how can we help people around us who may be falling victim to some of the conspiracies? Um, it occurs to me that there's a parallel there for therapy and um, what's been mentioned um, by work done by, by Ray on self-concept change, that self-concept right. change is little and slow, and people have disconfirming evidence about themselves that shows positive things, but they disconfirm it and invalidate it. And right. you see the same thing with conspiracy theorists, that they invalidate information that doesn't fit their existing model, their belief system. Uh, so asking them to deconstruct that, maybe the, the, the barrier that makes sense is that they don't, they're being asked to, um, dump all of their status with their existing families and communities and dump the new status. And that's a big, you know, uh, in the judgment diagram, they would not do that. So that's why maybe this, there's this impossibility of getting them to look at competing news sources that would quickly right. debunk all of that. Do you find that parallel and with self-concept so, change? Well, my original, one of the original thoughts before I got into conspiracy theories was I kept getting bothered by listening to pundits say, all we need is a common set of facts. And I heard Pete in the background saying, what the hell is a common set of facts? <laughs> we all live in one world, yeah. right? But different realities. <laughs> right. and, and then it occurred to me more and more, especially reading Cone's stuff on millinery movements, we're not talking about merely uh, something in the K parameter, right? We're talking about a whole community, right? Where your life is embedded in this. And Q is, a, is really a, a very strong case of this. One of the things I didn't talk about with Q is, is how many families are, have, have been um, estranged from one another as a result of Q. Uh, that people won't, you know, can't, they, they find their, you know, their parents have become Q members. They can't even talk to them anymore. Right. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly strong. And, and I always like to be an introduction to Ray. So I'm glad you brought that up. Well, and maybe, yeah, the, maybe their AOC is broken, but the yeah, last point is, is there yeah, is let me move on because we've had uh, we have another couple of questions and we only have five minutes. Um, also, do you, Charlie, want to stop share so that people can see everyone or see you? Uh, so uh, there's a hand raise for Anne first and then when and then we probably are going to have to stop. But what we uh, do is leave the um, computer, the, the Zoom on during the 10 minute break so people can keep talking who would like to do that. So, Anne, you're on next. No, I was just clapping. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, when then? You know, one of the things I think that um, is uh, very troubling uh, in a kind of longer point of view is that, um, you know, we're dealing with you know, people who are socially isolated primarily or people with um, a kind of obsessive uh, and or paranoid bent in terms of organizing particular facts as, as an initial. Um, in the history of, uh, of all of the um, established religions, um, all the long-term religious trends, work that you know, sort of centered at the beginning of culture and personality theories and, and anthropology, are the fact that these conspiracy theories are also parallel to you know, like the crisis, our crisis cults. They begin as, as crisis cults. Out of crisis cults, if they assume enough power to, and enough uh, in-groups, we end up with something that is no longer considered a cult, um, but a religion. And, um, you know, you can look at some of the belief structures, the organizing belief structures of almost all of the fundamental religions, and you're going to see something that is that bears more than a family resemblance to this cockamamie stuff. And so I think the question in some ways that's sort of alarming is at what point do we see these ideas become a theology 
that then has a dominant feature within a culture. And, um, you know, God help us. <laughs> so by that definition, do, do religions fit this paradigm case for conspiracy theories? Uh, they almost always do is in their origins. Um, uh, probably one of the, you know, they're, um, they almost have always, uh, whether we look at uh, Native American religious groups, um, uh, groups that came out of, you know, the Abrahamic traditions, uh, um, the shamanic traditions, they almost always, at least, at least the histories begin with um, a, a very powerful crisis cult um, that involves a certain degrees of indoctrination in which one of the first rules, and this is a rule that, that, uh, that Mary Douglas argued about the nature of kosher, is that the abominations of Leviticus is that you don't have truck with things or views that don't fit your initial uh, worldview. And that um, uh, it's the isolation of a worldview with an enforced requirement that you shall have no other gods before thee that uh, tends to keep these things in place if you can control the population, which is to say, if you can control your children and you know, okay, we how have, are the kids uh, of these people? Who are the kids of these people going to become? So, uh, Ned, I don't know if you want to answer that or go to the next. We have one more. We have two minutes left, uh, and we have one raised hand here. How do you want to? Do you want to answer this, or do you want to go to the next question? You mean Charlie? Not Charlie? Ned. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, it's Charlie. Oh, I don't know why I said that. Yeah, Charlie. We're often confused. <laughs> uh, no, go ahead to the next question. It's okay, fine. Lane, you're on, if you wanna unmute. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, I had occasion to ask Pete this question. I said, Pete, uh, how come churches are not centers of spirituality and hospitals are not centers of healing and universities are not centers of learning? And he said, well, there's a spirit of God or spirit of spirituality that comes and people are, are uh, drawn to that spirit and then an, in, a, an institution forms around it. The institution carries on and the spirit gets up and leaves. <laughs> that was a nice summer. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, you know, Tony Tupman in Being, Belonging, and, and Becoming talks about that very thing and, and how communities change. Yeah, I assume okay, you probably thank you. Thank you so much. This was excellent. We're, as I said, we're going to, I'm going to stop the recording right now.